So welcome to a little video that I've made here to celebrate a number of things. First of all, we got the pricing for the MX30 to come from Mazda today. And I'm going to go into that in a minute. But right now, this interview that is coming up is an exclusive in Ireland and exclusive to this channel. So it's very good of Mazda to organize this for me today. It's to celebrate Jo Stenuit becoming the design director of Mazda Europe. I got an exclusive one-to-one -one talk with him uh, via Zoom, which was absolutely brilliant today. And it's very interesting stuff that he's covering as well. A man with a real long history in Mazda and a long history in the motor industry as a car designer. You know, he's designed interiors of some phenomenal machines out there. And he's now in charge of MX30 project and what it contains and all the other projects that are happening as design director in Europe. So. Stay tuned for that. I'm going to put that up right next. But right now, I'm just going to go through real quick for Irish audiences, really. We're looking at the Mazda MX-30, which will be available in 2021, January at retail. The price, price is going to be 42295 Can you imagine the look of that car? Okay, so it's a little bit short range, but the look of that car for 42295 Now, grants, obviously, you're going to get the old grants on it. So it's 32 Two nine five, so ten thousand euros of grants available. It's going to have adaptive LEDs. I'm reading off a list here: a signature LED lights, eighteen inch alloy wheels, privacy glass in the rear. Uh, seats are modern confidence. I'm looking forward to having a go on that. Modern confidence sounds good. And considering who designs interiors and who's the chief design interiors. Anyway, Joe is going to be on in a few minutes. So, so many little bits and pieces that are going to be in this car and I had this exclusive that would chat with Joe. So, listen, I'm not going to interfere any further. It's only going to be Joe on the screen. You will hear my voice asking the questions, but I just left Joe on the screen to answer the questions along the way. It's a very interesting talk from a very interesting person. So, hopefully you will enjoy this. It's something a little bit different for this channel. Next up is more documentaries. So, make sure you hit the subscribe button and I'll see you after this video. You've been over 20 years in Mazda, right? You studied in the Royal College of Art, vehicle design there. And I noticed that over the years you've been there, a lot of your projects have been on the interior of cars. Yes. Uh, you're, you're, it's kind of a fascination in, in every single product, right through 2002, 2006, 2008, up to, up, right up to there when you were assistant chief designer. It has all of your influence been about interior design or have you always had an eye on exterior? It, for me, it's mainly been interior design. And basically, when you go into the car industry in the design department, you almost have to choose between interior and exterior because it is a slightly different way of working. And mm. I chose interior because before I studied vehicle design, I studied product design. So I felt more related to interior. And especially now, I see also a lot more interesting stuff happening on the interior and interior than on the exterior. Mm -hmm. And where did you, how did you get into car design, the car industry design part? I mean, it's, it's not exactly a straight line into the car industry. It's a, it's a tough place to get going in. So where, where'd you start with that? Um, if, if we go all the way back to secondary school where I told my parents I wanted to do art school and they said, no way. Um, they luckily told me there's something called product design. So that, that kept me in secondary school doing physics and, and mathematics. Mm. So I went into product design for five years, uh, but I always wanted to do car design. I've always been drawing cars in, in, on any paper that I could get hold of. Um, and so when I finished product design, that dream was still there. And what we did actually kind of by accident, we jumped into a Renault Clio and drove to uh, Lake Geneva uh, with three guys and I think uh, I think we even slept in the car and <laughs> because there was the uh, art center college uh, in Vevey at yeah. the lake uh, which was one of the um, car design schools and I remember arriving there and there was a there were a lot of Porsche so I thought wow the professors seem to make a lot of money here mm. turned out it was the <laughs> students that drove the Porsches uh, so we felt a bit like, mm, I think this is maybe something for rich kids. So we, we drove home a bit disappointed. And then I applied basically naively at the RCA because as a Belgian, you know, you don't uh, have a lot of confidence in yourself normally. You yeah. think, well, car design, that Belgians can't do that. So naively, I sent my portfolio together with a friend. And then 
was selected for the interview and then selected to go there. And then that was a shock uh, because then I had to get all the money together. But, you know, <laughs> it, it, just, it just worked. Um, and again, it was a bit naively, uh, a bit of hard work and, you know, got me there. And so was it exclusively car design? You were studying the Royal College of, of Art or did you study more art as well? No, it was, it was, it's called vehicle design. I think it's still called vehicle design. Um, yeah, so it's, it's focused on, on car design. Yeah. And your fir- what was your first gig then as, as a car designer? Was it exterior or interior? Or was it a particular car? Or it was just kind of job lot stuff. Well, actually, my very first job in the car industry was at Opel uh, in, uh, near Frankfurt, where I actually did digital modeling. Mm. And that's something I learned in RCA on my own. So modeling... Uh, exteriors, interiors in, in a three-dimensional way, which was very new at that time. Mm. So that was my route into car design. I spent doing that for about three years. And then I said, okay, now I, wanna, I really want to do car design. And luckily with the background of 3D modeling, it, it worked. And I, I can't remember why I applied at Mazda, but I did apply at Mazda. And uh, yeah, it worked. And do you still do clay designs or are you still a hands-on kind of designer or do you prefer to just have it at a sketch and turn it into a 3D? Myself? Mm. I, I let people do the work. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been doing a lot of sketching lately. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got a wonderful team of actually more talented people than me, so I don't see the point why I should be sketching. But yeah, we, we're working close together. Very good. Still, still a lot on clay. Is it really still, the clay is still a big thing, yeah. Yeah, especially the, the small models because we can turn them out really quickly and you can generate a lot of crazy ideas really quickly. So, yeah, it is important. Wild. And with the MX-30, so that's going to be EV, right? Yeah. How much of that, how much of that design, when you set out to design that, it is with the thought of where batteries are going to fit, the width of the car, the kind of drivetrain effort in it, or are you and your team, you come up with a design and then you make the engineers make everything fit into that space? No, it's, it's always a, a working together. And especially with the MX-30 as the first EV, it, it was a bit of a challenge for everybody. But we, not just with the MX-30, with every car, we work close with engineering from the beginning. Sometimes we make them, like I, I remember with the MX-5, we appetite their passion with some very early models mm. so we want to get them into our kind of uh passion and feeling and understand what we want to achieve uh, yeah. with the ev the mx30 it was a bit back and forth because it, it was new for for everybody mm. yeah. was there one particular thing that stands out in the ev platform that, that brought your design major design alter or change or any of that sort of thing not really i think it was Already from from the very first beginning, we knew we wanted to do something uh, different and a very lifestyle oriented car, mm. and a, a bit um, I would say less arty as the uh, CX30 and the Mazda Mazda 3, a bit more product designing. But mm. that was clear from the beginning. Yeah, because the EV batteries move the weight very low in the car, which is something that I always remark. As soon as you get into an EV, you just know you're in one because it's so quiet underneath you. It's not just because the drivetrain, just because there's so much oh. stuff under the floor of the car okay, yeah. has made it quieter underneath too. Mm-hmm. So with that kind of weight shifting down the bottom, does that alter um, shock absorbers or you know that suspension system inside yeah. has to be all altered for that as well? I guess it does, but... I'm just a designer, not an engineer. So, <laughs> <laughs> But with the aerodynamic end of it as well, it would also change the shape of the front of the car. It does. And also the, the bottom of the car, you know, because of a battery, no exhaust system. So everything's flatter. Yeah. Yeah. And with the Kodo design ethos that Mazda have behind, and of course the Jin Bai Tai, Horse and Rider and Wan, the whole, the whole ethos they've got behind. How does your MX-30 kind of fit into this and where are you going to go with that? Like you, that, that design will have to develop over time with it as well. I mean, it's, um, we're in the second phase of Kodo and the second phase of Kodo is all about creating motion and emotion with the least possible elements. And with the CX-30 and the Mazda 3, we've done it in a very arty way with really beautiful surfacing, um, you know, where, where reflection on the side surface 
play an important role. On the AMIC, AMIX 30, we wanted to have the same kind of corridor philosophy, but with a different expression. Also, again, very simple, um, more product-like, let's call it a bit more modern. We're not crazy modern like some of our competitors did, especially in the beginning of EVs, where they created some really strange looking cars. We mm -hmm. wanted it to be, we didn't want it to be alienating our customers. It should be easily recognizable as a car that they can relate to. Uh, so that was, that was the, the whole point. So is the idea then to make EVs more normal, and I'll say normal in quotation marks now, more of a normal looking car, because as you say, a lot of the older design stuff, they filled in the back wheels, they did some, some wild, long, skinny shaped cars, it just didn't look like normal cars. So is Mazda going to go that direction? Are you going to go that kind of normal car route? Yeah, and I think for us, Mazda? yeah, for us, the first thing is, it's a Mazda, and then it's an electric car. Also, because in the future, we'll... Um, and not just us, but many people will offer uh, a lot of different powertrains. So we're not going to develop a look for each kind of different powertrain. So for us, it's it's first uh, a Mazda, a car, a lifestyle product, and then it's an EV. And as a designer, does this kind of free you up in a certain way? Because if you have a unique drivetrain to each car, it's you have to design each car separately. But if you have one drivetrain that you're designing around, does that kind of free you to, to make you go crazy with your designs or or even just kind of push the boundaries of design a little bit more? We, um, with the MX-30, we could do that a bit on the interior through the center console and the space that we got there because we don't have a, like let's say a, a physically connected gear shifter. Um, for the rest of the package, we haven't really taken full advantage, but I'm sure in the future we wish we could, um, you know, change uh, layouts a lot more than, than we have at the moment. Because, mm, I mean, you can physically shift batteries forward or backwards or through the car and making the boot space bigger, or making the back seats bigger. Yeah, it's not so easy because there's a lot of regulations about safety, you know, and crash safety and stuff, which, for instance, in, in China is a bit more... Uh, lenient and in Europe is quite strict so it mm. is it is not so easy as it looks um, to move batteries around. Mm. And have you had, have you other EV products in mind? I know you probably can't discuss exactly what they are but have you have, what other range of cars are you looking at? Is there like I mean, an electric MX-5 or any oh. of that kind of range of it? I, I hope so but I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what's next for you? What's next? Are you back out of... Um, out of quarantine and start to move back into work and back into offices and things. Yeah, we are, we're slowly, I mean, half of the team is already back in the office. Um, most of the people that are still at home are the people that have children um, because the schools are not open yet. So, um, but work wise, we're already thinking of the next generation of vehicles, um, the next step of uh, Cordo philosophy, which is very scary, but also very um, cool period in design scary because you don't know where it's going to lead to mm. cool is because i'm not saying you can do anything you like but it's you know it's opening the gates of uh, creativity again and how close are you working with the, with your japanese crew you know they, i'm sure they have some sort of design influence on top of what you want to do here in europe um we have definitely weekly contact with um some like we have a lot of contact with the advanced um, design chief. We I have contact with Maeda-san quite a lot. Um, what they expect from us is to come with fresh ideas that come from Europe that are influenced through European lifestyle. So we're kind of a kind of a constant inspiration for them, mm. in a sense. Because I find Europe is a, a unique sort of set of requirements, not just from a legal perspective, but Europeans are, are weird from top to bottom. You start going down, way down into Spain and go all the way up into Northern Europe. The tastes change right across the way. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you even begin to find a middle ground for where what German people like versus what Spanish people like being two different things? We don't really ask that question. We just, we see what we've done now, especially in the latest Cordo um, phase is, we went back to good car design, we believe, with the least possible elements. And to me, that's kind of a, a that's globally accepted as, as good design, we noticed already. You know, if you see what, what awards we won, 
Mm. And I think that's the key to be able to to not cater for certain nationalities or regions, but just make sure you do proper good design without trying to be cool or fashionable. And I think we managed to do that. And is there any new materials that you're using right now that are being researched? Because I know there's, not, there's a lot of research going into like bamboo seats and kind of, you know, really the, the materials things are made out of to be either recyclable or from recycled materials. So is there anything that you're kind of researching that actually would make it easier to design cars possibly? Um, well, you know, in the MX-30, we have a, a whole bunch of uh, interesting ecological materials, including the cork, which I think is, is fantastic. I think we're the first company to introduce cork in a production vehicle, um, which kind of brings the whole idea of ecological thinking into the car because it's, a, it's, it's real cork. It mm -hmm. also brings our history into the car because we started as a cork manufacturer. Um, and of course we will, I think the, the MX-30 was a very good vehicle to um, start um, displaying these very ecological materials, but of course, well, we will continue doing that. Um, and we've done that in the past as well. Yeah, because there's a lot of pressure right now on, on the car industry to find ecological ways to do basically everything that we've done for 100 years now or more than 100 years. Yeah. So like electric cars are very, very old. They were before yeah. petrol and diesel cars were electric cars and mm -hmm. steam cars and stuff. So we're kind of coming back, we're nearly full cycle again. <laughs> we're nearly yeah. back where we started again. But like there's still a future, I still think, for, for clean diesel and clean petrol mm. technology and gasoline particulate filters and i know mazda invested a lot of effort in their petrol technology will that continue for them are you going to continue i know you're not on the engineering side of it but from a design side you'd be thinking about exhaust pipes and things coming down the back of it so is there is there a future to that part or is it going to go all kind of electric i hope there's a future in in petrol cars and i think there is as uh, definitely in the near future um i love old cars so i like the smell of petrol and and the noise of an exhaust but i also like the you know the driving sensation of a of an electric car which sometimes reminds me of driving an old citroen ds or something yeah, it's kind yeah. of floating and and yeah it's just a, a different way of, of driving so yeah i think we'll definitely in the near future continue with um a multitude of, of powertrains and do we have a favorite car design whether it be yours or somebody else's, is there an exterior or interior design that you take kind of, you put up on your wall and go, God, that was a good design. I, I don't have many cars on, on mm. my walls, but uh, I, I mean, I, I would go back to old cars, basically. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, I have a Datsun 240Z myself, oh, wow. uh, which is a classical sports car look. It's unmodified, but, I take it, is it? Not, you haven't... Uh, unmodified, yeah. All right, okay. Um, but... You know, if I had the money, I would go for a Toyota 2000 GT or a Cosmo Mazda. Really? But, uh, yeah. Yeah, 2000 GT. That was the, of course, James Bond car. They ripped the roof off of it for one of the James Bond movies. Um, an amazing looking. You know, I think there was only three or four of the ones that had no roof on them. Oh, really? Okay, could be. Yeah, because... That's Sean even more Connery expensive. Couldn't, they couldn't, yeah, they couldn't fit. He couldn't fit into it. He was too tall for it. So they had to take the roof thought, off for okay. the James Bond scene. So they only ended up with two or three of them at the time. Yeah, an amazing looking car. Is there a future design that, or a design language that's coming at you that, that's making sense at the moment? I mean, from an ecological point of view or from, from just designing for EV or designing for the future? Is there somewhere you're looking right now that's, that's showing what we should be doing? I think what we should be doing also... If you look at what's happening with Corona, I think many people had a lot of time to think. Mm. So I think they might start rethinking about the the you know the value, not the monetary value, but the value of a car. What does it bring? What do I want to do with it? It might be that in the next couple of years, a lot of people will do holidays with the car again. How does that change the way we design cars? Uh, how they use cars? It's it's. I think it's it's quite a quite a big change that maybe already was starting, but I think Corona just, just sped it up. You know, we've been catapulted in the future. Mm. And uh, yeah, we, we, it's definitely something that we think about even when we design, or when we think of new values for our cars. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you, talk, you talk about maybe the, like the urban car disappearing mm. to some degree and people kind of car sharing or, or using public transport instead. Yeah, I think that that's might be one aspect. Although I think 
Um, many people who, who don't buy cars at a certain point in their life, they will buy a car. I think that's very often that happens when they have children and they mm. suddenly see you know, the need of a car. And, but also, I mean, not everybody's living in the city. So, I mean, the, the, there will still be cars. Yeah. I think a lot of the car sharing companies are giving up, I think. No, did I not read? Yeah, a lot of them seem to be regressing rather than pro progressing. Yeah. Mm. I'm not sure people want the hassle. There's a lot of hassle attached to that kind of renting thing and then you're insuring somebody else's car. There's just so many little hassles that should be evened out or ironed out by now, but they're really not. Mm. Um, like automated driving cars should be long since here, but they're never, I don't think they're ever going to really be that kind of, I think we need pedestrianized area to have a, a unique spot in them for allowing automated yeah, driving if, to happen. Exactly. If you would build a new city like they do in China, you could incorporate that. But mm. doing that in thousand year old cities it's 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 a lot more complicated and i've been talking to engineers who are specialists and they said you know the, the first 95 percent of the autonomous driving is there it's just the last five percent is so difficult and so mm. complicated including legislation but um yeah it's, it's, you can imagine it's automated really driving hard. automated car on a cobblestone street just doesn't make any sense it's that european thing where you be on an mm. autobahn one second on a cobblestone street the next and it's the mm. same car you didn't change cars mm. so it's a difficult i suppose a difficult route to take but from a design aspect if you were to design an automated driving car obviously you're going to set out to dr design an entirely different machine you know, i mean where do you even begin to think about that sort of thing no steering wheel no gear shift no clutch box no nothing well, we've, we've, we, we ourselves haven't really gone very deep into it, but we see a lot of um, students, you know, we have a lot of contact with um, uh, car design schools. We see a lot of students coming up with ideas for that. And that's a, very often around changeable interiors, mm. you know, turning seats, turning the car a bit into more like a living room. Um, and I think with the MX-30, we've, we set a small step in that direction. If you, uh, if you look at the MX-30, it, it's maybe less car-like and more, more home-like. Mm. So you feel a bit more relaxed, I guess, than, than in, a, in a car. And like all design used to design basically around a driver. So you, you started out figuring out how to make the driver really comfortable and make sure he can reach everything. And then you think about the rest of the passengers in the car. How much of it now is more about the rear passengers, things like USB ports or, you know, screens in the back or something where the, where the rear passengers are looked after as well. Is that coming into the, the very beginning of design or is it still started with the driver? Um, at the moment, we're still uh, concentrating on the driver. Yeah, for us, it's really important. I think it's also important to make sure, you know, we, we see in, in our competitors, the design is very much... Um, like overload of, of, of technology and overload of screens. And yeah. we want to avoid that. We think that's not the way to go. It, it reminds us a bit of, I think it was the 80s where you had a lot of concept cars with a lot of buttons and everybody thought it was cool, but yeah. they disappeared really, really quickly because it was confusing. So yeah. we tried to concentrate on, on, on the basics and, and try to do that very well. Mm. And I noticed one feature of design that I've seen more recently on a number of different vehicles is where the bonnet line, the opening bonnet line is moved back up the bonnet. So you have a, a, a front shade. It, it, I suppose from safety terms, it's probably something to do with a safety end of it rather than anything. But is that a, it's like a clamshell closing uh, for mm -hmm. a bonnet now. I noticed that in the MX-30 as well. Is that something that's coming from safety or is that just a design? You like the idea of moving the bonnet line up a bit? It's, it's partly design, it's partly safety, it's partly insurance as well. Because if you have a, a frontal impact, then you don't have to change the, the bonnet, which is very, very costly. Mm. Um, but I like the kind of enclosed bonnet. If, to me, it feels a bit more product-like. So it works on the MX-30, I think. Yeah, it looks well on the front. I do like it. Normally, that line, sometimes if they get that line wrong across the front, it actually looks like something's been drawn on, a line that's mm -hmm. not supposed to be there. But it looks good on the front of that. Do you get involved with the, I know you get involved with the shape of the headlights, but do you get involved with what powers the headlights behind to see? Because like LEDs have, have allowed you to be able to have a brighter bulb in a smaller space. So is that affecting the way you design the front of cars as well, knowing that you can get the same level of bulb light coming from a headlamp, yeah. even if it's smaller? Definitely, and especially with our second phase of quarter where we try to minimize the elements, that really helped us, you know, we could make everything smaller on the front, 
uh, which gave, gave us a bit more uh, surface uh, to play with, or actually not to play with, but to keep it simple and empty. Yeah, mm. yeah I noticed that. You, you, a lot of people make them very busy. Um, I'm thinking more of sort of a Toyota approach to things where the front of the car is incredibly busy mm. looking. You know, it's, it's mm. active. And I noticed that Mazda tend to, to make slow lines, gentle lines on the front. There's mm. less active going on the front. Mm. Is that something that you set out to do? I mean, is that where you're going with the Kodo end of stuff? Try and keep it as simple as you can. Yes, basically, and for us, it's it's good design, and it's 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 difficult for us, or at least in the beginning it was, because car designers tend to want to draw a lot of lines, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of highlights. Mm. But we had to restrain the designers in a sense and say, look, this is enough, and the the few elements that we have, let's let's develop them into you know into the last micrometer and make sure that those elements are perfect. And I think with I think we managed. The, the doors, this is a contentious issue some people have, the doors opening rearwards, um, which would have been something that's, uh, is a Mazda design, so it, it, it has been done by Mazda before, the, the doors opening backwards on top of themselves. Is that something you wanted to do for, is there a, a technical reason behind that or is it just something for design purposes you want to do the doors opening the rearward? I mean, it's designed because the sensation you have um, is fantastic, but it's also very much a, a, a practical thing or a lifestyle thing. You know, if you open the doors, you can get your children in the back of the car. Mm. It's 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 a lot more easy in, in most of the situations. And again, as you said, it's it's again referring to the history of Mazda. So I think for, for this car, it fits. It doesn't mean we want to do this for, for every car. It's like a reinvention of an old design. It's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. I mean, it looks mm. fantastic on the car. Mm. Yeah, it does. I'm anxious to see this car. <laughs> What's oh, I haven't off? seen it yet. Oh, so. <laughs> Other than pictures of it, I haven't actually seen uh, okay. it in the metal yeah. yet. That's the next part. And, and most of the Mazdas, you know, they look great on pictures, but they look fantastic in real. <laughs> yeah, often, yeah. Before I sat down, I studied your history of design. Some of the stuff you've done on interiors has been incredible. Oh, thank you. I, mean, the, I, mean, you, I must say, you, you are well prepared. Uh, <laughs> not all journalists are, but so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. That's no problem. Um, I love this. I love where you're going with that CX30. I really do. I hope that proceeds. It's very clean. It's very nice. Very modern. Very clinical looking. But I'd say in the metal, it just looks phenomenal because that's where your design should be going to moment. Look forward to the MX5 as well, electric MX5. <laughs> I'll 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 send that to um, uh, MC Japan. Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> That'd cool. be great. So there you have it. That's Jo Stenuit, the chief designer of Mazda Europe, uh, chatting to me there. Uh, I'd love to do more of that series. Obviously, that needs support. So if you can support the channel, it'd be brilliant. There's some list of links down below there for Patreon or PayPal or whichever way you can. It's always good. Um, the Patreon guys get a Zoom meet, a Zoom chat up with me as well. So uh, there's a lot of perks and benefits in the Zoom stuff that's, that uh, I just open to everybody. So if you're interested in that, do it. If you're not, then hit the subscribe button at least. That's the least you can do. It's actually probably the best way of supporting the channel of all is just subscribe. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And until the next time, I will see you on the far side. Thank <laughs> you.